Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. Thank you. You're bringing the revelation of the great work that Jesus has accomplished for us. Thank you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you at this time of year regarding the subject of redemption and the tremendous work that Jesus has accomplished. And we see from Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2 and following, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are holy meetings with him. Even these are my feasts, which are appointed times that he had them come, because they're all pointing towards what the appointed times when Jesus would fulfill what these are all about. Six days shall work be done. The seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. Holy convocation, you do no work therein. It's the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. The six days was pointing towards the 6,000 years that man could work out his own salvation. And then the Sabbath, he would not be able to do it any longer. So they had this reminder every week of this. And so we see that this is speaking of what this happens during the time of man's existence on the earth before there'll be a new heavens and a new earth after the 7,000 years are over. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you proclaim in your seasons. So this being the season, we're proclaiming that. And to show you, this is the Hebrew calendar for 2023, you see here. And showing you where we are at. This is Nisan, which is the first month of the year. And you see that this is Nisan day one here, which would be like a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was Thursday. Last Thursday was Nisan day one, which you see the parallel over here was March 23rd. And so we are one, two, three. This is the fourth day of Nisan. And this is the time when we see the fulfillment of the proclaiming the fulfillment of what Jesus accomplished in his first coming with the time on the, the 10th day which would be the 10th the day is the day that uh, when he came in and it was on at that point it changes every year at that point it was on a Saturday Sabbath and then the 14th day was on a Wednesday as you will see when we get to that part and that was when he was the Passover lamb who became sin on the cross and then the unleavened bread with the on from there until the time of the first fruits which was fulfilled when he was raised from the dead praise God so this is part of what we'll be talking about as we're going through this. But we began today talking especially about what happened from the very beginning. It is important to understand all these things. We pointed out that in the beginning here, this is about God's preparing or creating the heaven and the earth. This is not when it was done. This is just declaring all the things that happened in him bringing this forth. And these are all, this is a restrictive relative clause followed by their three clauses that talk about specific things that were ready to come to pass in the Hebrew. The earth was unformed. It was without any, it was void and empty at that point. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was moving. This means that we're in the peel stem. It means to be hovering upon the face of the waters, ready to bring forth what God would bring into being. And we saw that God began to speak. And how he brings things into being is through speaking his word. His word is that which releases everything that he purposes. And he began to speak, and let there be light, and there was light. And we talked about the many areas where he spoke things into being. We came down to verse 26. God said, let us, speaking of the plurality of the Godhead, make man in our image, after our likeness. This is the plurality showing with the plural pronouns here. So he brought, made man in his image, and he gave him dominion <coughs> over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, the earth, over everything. He gave him authority. And we also pointed out that everything that he did, he brought it into being through the word of God. We saw the scripture over in Psalm 33 and verse 6, how he brings everything into being. This is how he does everything in your life as well. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, 
and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth as he speaks things forth to bring them into manifestation. And we talked about how he accomplished this. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into him the breath of life that brought the spirit into him, and man became a living soul, spirit, soul, and body. And now, the, of course, he was, had a spirit that came from God. He was right with God. And we pointed out what the purpose of, we gave these scriptures before, but the purpose of bringing forth the earth and all these things was to be inhabited and that his purpose is he wanted a family. And we also pointed out that the earth belongs to him. He is the owner of it, but he did give it into the hands of man for a period of time. We saw this in Psalms 115. Psalms 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children or the sons of men, this means. He gave it into their hands. So now it was given to him, not given to him like he now owns it, but given to him as a lease for a period of time. And that lease, as we pointed out, is 6,000 years. And this lease is shown here in Luke chapter 20, verse 9, when he began to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and let. This word we pointed out means lease. We showed you in Freiburg's uh, lexicon that it means a lease. A lease he let it forth to the husbandman and went into a far country for a long time. So it was given into the hands of man as a lease. And we pointed out that this period of time is 6,000 years. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 where the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man, and why was this? This is after, when, after man had gotten worse and worse. Evil was going forth all over the world. The wickedness of man was great in the earth, as it says in verse 5. Even every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually, terrible. And so what did God decide he was going to do? He repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and grieved him in his heart because he hadn't responded to him. And he was walking contrary to the ways of the Lord. This is, of course, because of the fall of man that occurred. So he said, I'm going to destroy him. Now, of course, the reason why that he couldn't get rid of the situation and just change it himself is because he does everything according to law. He does everything that's right. And he gave a lease into the hands of man. He can't just take it away from him and say, sorry, uh, we're going to you know, take it away from you. No. He said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. This is important to understand. He was striving with him because he had rebelled against God and was not walking in the ways of the Lord, even though after the fall of man, he was commanding man of what to do. For that he also is flesh. And this doesn't mean just the fact that he had a physical body. It's misleading if you don't understand the word also that is here in the Hebrew. It is the word shagog, which means to go astray and err and commit sin. That's why he was flesh. And Young's brings it out. This is why we put Young's up there, because he did it, has done a pretty good job many, many, many places where he brings out the true rendering. In their erring, they are flesh. Or in their going astray and committing sin, which is what happened at the fall of man, then is he, along, is he any more spirit in the relationship with God? No, he died. Now he's flesh, as we'll see in just a moment. We'll show you that scripture where he died. It says his days shall be 120 years. And we pointed out this is not talking about length of life, a span of life. We gave the, the many, uh, several scriptures that we looked at, and we saw the fact that and um, several of these, Abraham lived 175 years, Ishmael lived 130, Jacob lived 130, Isaac lived 180. Well, that's more than 120. And God's word doesn't, he does not say one thing one minute and then it's changed later on. No, this is not talking about the span of years. What is it talking about? It's talking about the time of the lease because 120 years, it's talking about jubilee years. So that's the way they thought in the Old Testament because every 50 years there would be a release from the 
things that had occurred where they had maybe gotten in bondage or had lost their possessions. This is shown over here in Leviticus chapter 25 when he talks about the Jubilee. In verse 9 it says, You'll cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month and the day of atonement. You'll make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. This is in the fiftieth year. You hallow the fiftieth year. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man to his possession. You'll return every man unto his family. This is every 50 years. And remember, everything that God has done is all pointing towards the ultimate fulfillment of it through Jesus Christ. This points to the ultimate time when the jubilee will occur, which is the final restoration of all things. And there will be complete liberty and this is going to be, though, after the time of the lease has been finished. So, the 120 was 120 jubilee years, and they were 50. So, 120 times 50 is 6,000. And that is the period of time that man had on the earth to rule. So, until that 6,000 years was over, God couldn't do anything because the lease was now, it was in control of man. But what happened? It wasn't in control of man anymore because of the fall that occurred. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, and we went through this this morning. We saw that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God said that they were not to partake of. The woman saw the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, took of the fruit thereof, did he, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. He rebelled against God. He did disobeyed the things that he told them to do. The woman, remember, was deceived, but the man was not. We saw this in 1 Timothy 2.14. Adam was not deceived. He knew what he was doing, and he's the one who was given that authority, well, oh, the lease, for 6,000 years over the earth. And the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. So we see that what happened from that, Satan got in control, he now became the one who was in authority over the earth. He became the one who is the God of this age, remember? And he became the ruler over the world system at that time. So that's the situation. Man, of course, was spiritually dead at that point in time because God had said back in Genesis chapter 2, as we brought forth in verse 16, where he commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the, the garden you mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. In the day that you eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And it's important to know that there's two words for die here. This is why Young's translates it, Dying, thou shalt die. Why does the Hebrew have the two words for die? Here's the first one. If you notice, it means die. And here's the second one that means die. In other words, what was going to happen if he disobeyed, he would die. And what was that? That was a spiritual death, separation from God. And because of that, then he would die physically is what the second one is referring to. So that's what happened. And that occurred. We didn't give you the scripture on it, but Genesis 5, 5 indicates all the days of Adam lived were 930 years and he died. But he died spiritually immediately when he had rebelled against God. We also pointed out the fact that Satan was jealous. And we won't go through all these scriptures, but we'll show you a couple of these. Isaiah chapter 14. And we did point out, just for your understanding, we'll cover this for a moment. From verse 7 and following, it's looking back on what happened to Satan as well as what would happen to him. And this is looking back from after the judgment that would come upon him because it says the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. Well, was that during the time when Satan was ruling for, oh, because having the lease for the 6,000 years? No. They break forth into singing. This would be after he was defeated and sent down to the pit, which you'll see. The fir, fir trees rejoice, the cedars of Lebanon say, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. There's, there's peace, see, in the earth. Hell from beneath is moved to, for thee to meet thee at thy coming. This is talking about 
Satan. He went down to hell when? He hadn't gone down there yet, but it's looking back on that. And from this standpoint, it's speaking of how he's going to be going down to hell after Jesus comes and takes back the earth and the judgment comes upon him and he then is going to be bound and put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. It stirs up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth is raised up in their thrones, all the kings of the nations. That shows you the kings of the nations have rebelled against God, unfortunately, and they're all ending up in hell. They weren't supposed to be, but they are. They'll all speak and say, art thou become weak as us? Art thou become like unto us? Which he will, because he'll be down in the pit. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, because he was the leader of praise and worship, remember. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. That's what it's like in hell. People are tormented with these worms covering them and spread under them. How art thou fallen from heaven? Now it's recounting what happened here. This is again looking back in the future, but looking backwards. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the earth, not to hell? First he is cast down to the, to the earth, Eretz, which means earth. O weakener of nations. This is what he does. This is what he's done throughout history. This is what he's continuing to do. And he will continue to do this to lead nations to be deceived through all kinds of means, witchcraft and sorcery, and, and bring the nations of the place, the ones that won't follow the Lord, they're all going to be judged and there's going to be a destruction and the time of the judgment upon the nations in fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, judgment. And why did he turn away from what position he was in? Because he was the archangel leading the praise and worship in heaven. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'll sit also upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. Notice, angels, they're in a different order, but they do have a will. They can choose, and they do have a heart. They can say things in their heart. They were to obey. They were given commands to obey God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This we pointed out in the Hithpael sense, a stem means to make oneself like. He wanted to be like God because God made man in the very image of God and they were all jealous about it. And so, of course, what was going to happen? You'll be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. But first he went down to earth. He had to go down to earth first because if he was in hell, how would he get in the garden? He was cast down to the earth first. And then he came and tempted the woman. And, of course, then having Adam, of course, having disobeyed God, gave the authority into the hands of Satan, and he became the God over this age and the ruler over the world. And we were pointing out at one point, we didn't quite finish this part, about these angels that fell. It speaks... We talked about in verse 3 about the red dragon having the seven heads and the ten horns and the seven crowns upon his heads. The seven heads, this is all speaking about the world governments. And there were five that already have occurred at the point in time when it's speaking, which was Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Medio Persia and Greece. And they'd all been eliminated by the time. And then the one that was at the present at this time was Rome. And then there's going to be a seventh one that will come on the scene before the end here of the church age. And then he also, though, we didn't look at the scripture, but we need to see it, of these angels that followed him in his rebellion. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. That means a third of the angels rebelled and followed after Satan, followed after him in his rebellion. They didn't like the fact that God made man in his image to make, have a family. They were jealous. And so, of course, then it also speaks of the dragon who stood before the woman ready to be delivered. And this is all pointing to when Jesus came, was going to be born, that the devour the child. Of course, he worked through Herod to try to get all the children two years and under to be killed. But, of course, the angel spoke to Joseph and had him escape to Egypt so he would be preserved. Not, of course, one step ahead of all the plans that the devil wanted to bring forth. 
We also need to point out, we did all bef before, but we pointed out in Ezekiel chapter 28, why, what happened with the devil. Remember, he's the one who was, had full of wisdom, is perfect in beauty. He was the light bringer. He was in Garden of Eden, in the Garden of God. He had all these precious stones. He was the leader of the praise and worship, timbrel and tambourine, which is rhythm, and pipes, which are all instruments, were in him in the day that he was created. He was the anointed cherub that covered the throne. And what happened to him? He was perfect in the ways that he was created. God makes everything perfect initially until unrighteousness was found in him. And the unrighteousness, of course, that was sin. He's the first one that caused the sin. And then, of course, then after he was cast down to the earth, then he got to the, there the woman was deceived and the man was not. And what happened when he sinned? That now lets sin come into the earth. First sin came into heaven because that's where the devil was or Lucifer when he sinned, unrighteous was found in him and he was cast out. But this is also why you'll see later how Jesus has to take his blood up there to cleanse everything in the heavens because it's been contaminated because of what Satan did. But we also see in Romans 5.12, because of man's sin, here it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. It's now affected everybody. And we also pointed out the fact that of these, the angels were, the, followed him were immediately sent to hell, but Satan instead was sent down to earth. He was to be a spectacle before all the kings of the evil things he had done. But unfortunately, man also sinned and gave place to the devil, and he became the ruler of the world. Here we see in 2 Peter 2.4, God spared not the angels that sinned, cast them down to hell, delivered them the chains of darkness. These aren't physical chains, or they're meaning he's in the state of darkness. He can never come to the light. They are finished. There is no salvation or reconciliation for them, and they're reserved for the judgment. And these angels, you have to realize angels, again, had a will, they had a choice, and they made a big mistake, and it's costing them forever now. The angels that kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He's reserved in everlasting chains under darkness to the judgment of that great day. We've also pointed out that now that Satan was the the God of this age. One thing you have to realize, he's not the God of the world. It's a mistake in the King James. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the God not of this world, you put the cursor over the word world, it is the word aeon, which means age. The word world is cosmos. He's the God of this age, not the God of the world. It all belongs to God, but he gave the lease. That's why that over this age that we're talking about, then he's the God of this age because he has control of the lease and has authority. So he also, of course, is still, he is the ruler over the world system that is until the time comes when the lease will be over and then Jesus will take everything back as he will conquer all of the, all, Satan and all the evil works and all the evil nations that have turned against him. We see in John 8, verse 44, Speaking of him now that he is the one who has become the father of, of over mankind because of man's sin, spiritually dead men who are going to unite with a spiritually, spiritually dead woman, they were both dead after what happened, are going to produce spiritually dead children. You're of your father, a father of the devil, the lust of your father, you'll do. And these people were speaking to the religious people. They, they thought that they were with, of God. No, they weren't. They were of the devil. And they were in the position now of Jesus, of course, was telling him that they were of the devil and the lust of their father they were doing, that they were now not spiritually right. They were under the control of the devil because they had a spirit that was wrong, not right. They were spiritually dead. They didn't understand these things, of course, because they were ignorant of many things that they should have known. We see also, though, that then 
God's plan of redemption, 1 Corinthians 2, 7, was a mystery. The devil thought that he had Jesus when they killed him. They thought he was the heir of the earth. They thought that they killed him, it'd be all, they would have control of the earth. <laughs> but they fell into the trap. God had a, the wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the age, not world, aeon, unto our glory. And what was that? That was that Jesus would have to go through the avenue of death to accomplish many things which we'll be talking about. We'll get to that on Sunday morning. We have many things that are important. He had to die to accomplish many things. But here it says, none of the rulers, princes or rulers, of this age, or the rulers of this age, knew. If they would have known what was going to happen by Jesus going to the cross and dying and what would, have to hap what would happen from that, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This is a hidden plan, wisdom, that was from God, a mystery. Paul's the one who got the revelation of it, and we talked about that. And we came to the place of realizing that this plan actually had been spoken forth by God of what he was going to do. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after the fall of man, this is what God says to the devil. I will put enmity between thee, you, and the woman. Why the woman? Because the woman was going to be the vessel that was going to bring the Savior into the earth. Between thy seed, which would be all who were born from that point on, everybody spiritually dead, and her seed. Well, the seed doesn't come from the woman. But this speaks of the fact that the seed will be in the woman, and that is when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, and then Jesus, the Word, was made flesh, planted in her, and came forth, and he was born. Now, Je called Jesus the Savior, the one who would save us from everything that the devil had done and all that man had done through his sin. It shall bruise or break the lordship of his head the same time he would bruise his heel. So he told them what was going to happen here. Yet they thought they had him by killing him. And of course, that was a great mistake. Now, we need to see that after the fall of man, of course, then he brought forth the, the man began to bring forth children. First he bare Cain, and then the second one was Abel. And God began to command man. The way he did everything from the very beginning was by giving commands. He didn't make a covenant with God, uh, with man, until after the time of the flood when the first covenant was with the rainbow. But he would command man. He would give his commands. His word controls everything, which is his law. And so he would command man on everything. Those who would walk in his ways and were obedient were the sons of God line. The sons of God line are those ones who obeyed God, while the ones who didn't were the sons of men and the daughters of men who rebelled against him. Unfortunately, then in doing so, then we see that almost everybody, almost the entire world, was not following the way of the Lord. We see, and we come down to Genesis 4.25, when Adam knew his wife again, this is after Abel had been killed by Cain, she bare a son called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me another seed. Since Abel was killed, he was the one who obeyed God, brought the tithe to him. He was declared as a righteous one. God brought another one. And this began the seed of the, led to the Messiah. This was the seed of the sons of God. And that began with Seth. And so then we see also that Seth, him was born a son and called his name Enos, Enos, which not men began to call in the name of the Lord. It's a mistake. Instead, this is what it says in the Hebrew, a beginning was made of preaching in the name of Jehovah. He's the one who began to preach the gospel. The reason we say this is it's not call upon. That's a mistake because there is a word in, here, here's the word in, this one is, the preposition in, 
and they didn't translate it. None of the translations have translated it, except for Young's. And he picked up the fact that it's not talking about calling upon. Instead, it was the preaching or proclaiming in the name of Jehovah. This is when the gospel began to be preached. And we pointed this out, but we'll just share with you for a minute that just for your understanding, because many people have thought that there was, must be some kind of error in the Word of God, and they look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, when it says, how he spared not the old world, was when he brought the flood, but guarded, philoso is the word, Noah, and notice what it says, the eighth and the word person has been italicized. It's not there. There's no Greek word for it, but they put it in. A preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Was Noah the eighth one in the line from Adam? No, he was the tenth. So was he the eighth person in the line? No, it was wrong. It was absolutely wrong, false, and this shows you why you have to look at the Word of God. In fact, here it will show you for a moment the genealogy. This is to help you to understand why you've got to look at the Word and see exactly what is being said and translate it correctly, otherwise you'll be in error. First Chronicles 1 Chronicles 1.1 begins this, this, the line. We have Adam, we have Seth, we have Enosh, that's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and Noah is the tenth. So he wasn't the eighth person. He was the tenth. So we go back to 2 Peter, and we got to see, well, what was this really saying? When you look at this word in the Greek, just to show you this, this is the word for eighth. It is an adjective. An adjective is going to describe, it could be just by itself say an eighth one, but it could also, it describes a noun if there's a noun that would be present that is describing. And here is the word that's the noun. In the Greek, when there's an adjective as this is, it has to, when it modifies something, it has to agree with it in case number, and person. That's how you know who it's modifying. The case is an accusative case. Here the gender is masculine. The number is singular. So if we want to find out what this is modifying, if there's a noun that's accusative, masculine, singular, we know what it's modifying. And here it is. Noun, accusative, masculine, singular. So how should it have been translated? Eighth preacher. Not person, a preacher. Did they translate it that way? No. Who trans even Young's didn't translate it correctly here. He didn't get it. Nobody's gotten it except for one translation I found. Look at all what they did with these translations. Because they reasoned that, well, the eighth must refer to something. So this is what they've all said. They preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others. With seven others? There's no seven others there in the Greek. Why would they add that in? Because they were reasoning in their mind, thinking of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, or 20, that is, where it says, when the ark was preparing the days of Noah, few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So, they're concluding, well, there were eight. So if he's the eighth, then there must have been seven other ones. And we're really, it really must be talking about the fact that he was being saved in the flood. Was it talking about being saved in the flood? No. It was talking about him being guarded before all that happened. He guarded Noah before he brought the flood upon them all. So, why didn't they translate it this way? Because they reasoned in their mind that it was talking about an eighth 
person, not an eighth preacher, even though the Greek clearly says eighth preacher because it's mass accusative masculine singular. Now, why did they do that? Because they all knew, all the scholars I'm talking about, everybody who's translated, they knew that Noah was the tenth. So he couldn't be the eighth person. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be right. So they thought, well, this must be talking about the eight that, that came through, that were saved, in, that were in the, in the ark there. That's why they started translating it this way and added things that are not even there with the seven others, with the seven others, with the seven others. This is the New American Standard. This is the ESV, English Standard Version. This is the NIV. This is the NLT. All of them talk about these things except Noah and his family of seven. Where'd they come up with that from? <laughs> they didn't get it from the Greek. They reasoned it in their mind. These guys are in trouble. You, can you add to the word of God and be right? No, you're gonna be judged. You're gonna, your name's gonna be taken out of the book of life. These translators are through because they didn't translate things correctly. Well, when we were looking at this, you see this is the eighth preacher. Well, I see you gotta translate this the eighth preacher of righteousness. But if he's the 10th, how does that line up? Well, the answer is you've got to find out where did the preaching start? Did it start with Adam? Or first and then we have Seth? No, those guys, neither of those ones were preaching. Who started the preaching? And this is why the key is how the translation was correct here by Young's. He began, was made of preaching in the name of Jehovah. So where did it start with? It started with Enos, who's the third. Well, that would make then Noah the eighth in the line of the preachers. They were all preachers. I point this out to you so you not understand what this is saying, but also to understand why the word is true. Don't think for a minute that it's not true. When it said eighth preacher of righteousness, it was right. They just didn't pick it up, and yet look at all the translations of that. And they've done this on many things where they have changed things. They reasoned in their mind. These guys are all in trouble. What a great mistake. Anyway, what we see from this is that began the sons of God line, and this sons of God line began, and we see that they were walking in line with the Word, even though they were spiritually dead, but they were obeying the commands of God. We even see, it speaks of the one Enoch was, came forth. Enoch was the one who it says he walked with God after he got, begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And then all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. He walked with God. He was not, for God took him. He didn't die. By the way, when he was taken, does that mean he was taken to heaven? A lot of people assume he was taken to heaven. No, he wasn't taken to heaven. He was taken to hell. Why was he taken to hell? Because nobody went into heaven until Jesus came and liberated them all from hell. Where would he have gone? In the upper compartment of hell, which was Abraham's bosom, which is the place of comfort. How do we know he couldn't have gone to heaven? Because was he born again? No. He walked with God, but he wasn't born again. And furthermore, the scripture says in John 3, 13, no man has ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Nobody went to heaven before. Not until after Jesus had accomplished the redemption and people were born again. And then those who were born again who were walking with the Lord, to be absent from the body would be present for the Lord. They would be able to go. So we need to understand that even though we walk with God, he didn't go to heaven. He would have gone to Abraham's bosom where he was in a place of comfort until Jesus came and preached the gospel to him. And we'll be talking about that at a later time. We see also, and we were talking about this at the end, but we want to pick up from here in Genesis chapter 6. Men were multiplying the face of the earth. Daughters were born unto them. These ones were not walking in the way of the word whatsoever. There was a sons of God line, though, but the multitudes were not. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, that they were beautiful, and they took them wives of all they chose. 
the sons of God who are following the commands of God, should they have taken the daughters of men who were not following? No. It contaminated them because their wives, we saw the scripture in 1 Kings 11, what happened with Solomon who took wives of the ites that he shouldn't have, it turned his heart away from the Lord and into idolatry. And that's exactly what happened. And so, we mentioned the fact that man now was so wicked because of his erring, he became become flesh. God, seeing the fact that he's got 6,000 years to deal with this man, 120 times the 50-year jubilee, 6,000 years, he's going to destroy, he's going to destroy them all. There were giants in the earth. We also point this out, but we want to bring this to you to, for who didn't hear this part. The giants in the earth, who are the giants? They're the Nephilim. And who were these ones? These are ones who had not walked in the way of the Lord. They were fallen ones. It means, the root means fall. These are ones who had fallen. And we pointed out that this is talking about, when we looked at the, the theological word book of the Old Testament here, we brought this up, the fact that it refers to those who were fierce warriors. And we pointed out that how did these people become such fierce warriors? Because of sin. When you sin, it produces violence. And these guys became very violent because of their continual sin. Notice the giants, and they were ruling because they were the most fierce ones in the earth in those days. It means already they were here. Also after that, which means afterwards in time, what happened? When the sons of God, that was the ones following God, came into the daughters of men, now they're disobeying God, it was a mistake, they bear children to them, the same became mighty men. These are men who were old men, mortal men of renown or of reputation because they, again, became wicked and evil as well. The point being is the giants were already here before this happened. The false teaching that you must be aware of, and it is prevalent throughout the body of Christ, is that the sons of God were the fallen angels who mated with the daughters of men and produced the giants. Well, that can't be because the giants were already here. And so that doesn't line up. How can anybody proclaim that? It's proclaimed all over the body of Christ. It's all lies. Because of they've listened to the book of Enoch, which is not a scriptural book, and it has all kinds of lies in it, 17 major lies in it that clearly show it's false. This, when God says the sons of God, he means the sons of God. Could this be angels? No, because it's sons of God. Bain Elohim. That's what this says in the Hebrew. So this is not talking about the fallen angels mating with the daughters of men. It is all a lying teaching that has gone forth. There is no such thing. So this is, of course, the fall was they, because they were doing this now, the rest of the sons of God, they all became contaminated as they were now, not walking in the ways of the Lord any longer. And the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every imagination of thoughts of the heart was only evil. And so it repented God that he made man on the earth and grieved him in his heart and said, I'm going to destroy man. He's going to destroy the whole works. He hadn't obeyed his commands. They weren't walking after his law. They were violating the things that he told them to do. So he's going to destroy them all. But there's one who found grace in his eyes. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why was that? These are the generation of Noah. Noah was a just man, righteous one, perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. Who will find grace with God at the end here as we approach the end of the church age? Same thing. The ones who are righteous, the ones who are perfect, have gone on to perfection, and the ones who are walking with God continually. He was doing what was right. And because of that, then he was going to be preserved. We see, though, as we go on, verse 11, the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. We pointed out that the corruption that we see going on in the world today with all the sin is also producing an increase in violence that will continue to increase as we go down these last days. So we see that this is where things are going to take us to. 
And he said, all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. I mean, Noah was the only one who left it was right. And so he told him, of course, to make the ark, and he was going to preserve him. We see in verse 22, Noah did according to all that God commanded him. That shows you another mark of people who are going to come through and not be judged in these last days. You obey the commands of God. It means you must live unto him. You can't walk in your own ways. And the Lord said to, to Noah, and to Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for I have seen thee righteous before me in this generation. God has to see you righteous, otherwise you won't be preserved. But if you are righteous, then you will be preserved. Well, what happened after that? Then we see that the judgment came as in verse 4, he spoke about how the rain would come upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And that, up to that time, it had not rained. The earth was watered by a mist. There was no rain yet that had even come at that point. We come down to verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, 17th day of the month, the day, that's when the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So that meant water came from the deep. That's from, up, from, from the, all the seas that were there. They came up. But also it came from the windows of the heavens were opened. We talked about this this morning that when God made the earth, there were waters and he created an expanse in the midst of those waters, and there were waters above, and there were waters below. The ones below, when he made the sea, the, the, the land, the earth, he gathered together with the seas. So there was the earth with the seas, there was the heavens where all the stars and sun and moon and all that were put in, but there still were waters above. Now what happened to those waters? This is when the windows of heaven were open and those waters were poured out on the earth and it was absolutely flooded. So the, all that water came down and flooded and brought forth the flood that, that covered the entire earth. And of course, the result was everybody was destroyed. It rained on the earth 40 days and 40 nights and the destruction had occurred. After this was done, God now had brought the judgment. But Noah was preserved, remember? And Noah is pointing towards the one who is going to be a righteous one, who is going to be perfect, who is going to have obeyed his commands, who will be seen righteous, who will be preserved. Remember, there's a plan that God has from the very beginning. And this speaks because there's another judgment. Remember, all the things that have happened before are, going, are all pointing towards what's going to happen at the end. And so we see in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, after the flood was over, and the waters that abated, the, rest, the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Why is this important to denote this? The seventh month is the time of the three fall feasts that are listed in the Feast of the Lord. We pointed out that the, his feasts are pointing towards what Jesus Christ would accomplish they're all pointing towards the work that he accomplished. There's seven feasts, and we'll be talking about those at a later time in detail. The first one was Passover, which where Jesus became the Passover lamb being made sin on the cross on the very day of Passover. The second one was unleavened bread, where he bore away that sin in hell for three days and three nights, paying the price for sin. And the third one is first fruits, when after he was born from spiritual death to spiritual life, he went forth and went up to heaven and poured out his blood on the mercy seat in heaven and cleansed everything, appeared unto God for us, having accomplished eternal redemption. You'll see that, all that at a later time. That's in the first month. Those three were fulfilled. Fifty days later is Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and caught, caught, brought forth the birthday of the church when man who was alive on earth got, could be born again and it began the church age period. So this now, that was in 40, 40, 50 days after the fulfillment of the first three. So the first four were fulfilled in the, in the first coming. But this is talking about the seventh month. The seventh month is when the other three occur. They're all fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus. And remember, this is after the judgment 
coming. The ark rested in the seventh month here on the 17th day of the month. What is the seventh, seventh month, 17th day? That is during the time of tabernacles. The three fall feasts occur in the seventh month. The first one is trumpets, which you'll see at a later time is the time of the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. The fulfillment of it is the rapture of the church after the judgment has come forth. Remember, this is all after the judgment. And after the judgment has come forth on the nations, then there'll be the rapture of the church at the end of the tribulation period. And then the second one is the Day of Atonement, which is on the seventh month, tenth day. That is when the time comes when there'll be the judgment on the nations. The Day of Atonement is the Day of Judgment. And that's when the battle of Armageddon will occur. The nation will be destroyed. Satan, all the ones that have rebelled against him, almost everybody will have been, die, have been died, have died, except, of course, all the Christians that are the righteous ones, holy ones who have gone to heaven for the marriage of the Lamb prior to that. But everybody on the earth will die except for a few people that are left. And so that is the second fulfillment. And then the third one in the seventh month is tabernacles. And that is what this is during the time of, because it's from the 15th to the 21st day in the seventh month. So this is pointing towards this fulfillment of the restoration of the earth, because what, this is all pointing towards what Jesus will do, because he's the fulfiller of it. Seventh month, 17th day of the month, and notice when the ark rested, it says it was on the mountains of Ararat. What does Ararat mean? The curse reversed. What was cursed? Man was cursed. The earth was cursed. Everything was cursed. What's Jesus going to accomplish? He's going to reverse the curse. He's going to deliver man so that man would not be cursed. He'd come back into relationship with God. And also, he's going to deliver the earth from all the evil nations and from Satan after the lease is over to reverse the curse that has come upon it. He is going to bring that forth, and this is what this is all pointing towards, the tremendous work that Jesus will accomplish here. And it's interesting, the seventh month and 17th day, can't be dogmatic about this, but this very well could be the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. The reason we say that is because the seventh month, 17th day, if we see what it speaks about Jesus when he began his ministry in Luke chapter 3. We see down here in verse 23. This is after it talks about the sons of God line, which begins, if we went backwards from verse 38, it talks about the sons of God line, where we have the son of God, the son of Adam, son of Seth, son of Enos. And then as we keep going down, um, through, if you go backwards, you see all the lineage of the sons of God line until we come to verse 23 when it speaks of Jesus being about 30 years of age, being as he supposed the son of Joseph, who is the son of Heli. So here, this speaks of Jesus, and now it's speaking to the sons of God. He is in that line, and it's talking about when he started his ministry because he was about 30 years. That means he wasn't 30 years yet. And when did this occur? This is occurring right before we see, if we go back now to the end of this, where it started it, and we come to chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to what? To be tempted of the devil. So when was he tempted of the devil? He was tempted of the devil for 40 days. And when would that have been? That would have begun on the month prior to Tishri, which is the seventh month, which would be the sixth month, and that's the month called Elul, E-L-U-L. -L. That is known as the month of repentance. And so, for 30 days of Elul, plus, it was 40 days, plus the first 10 days of Tishri, the seventh month, brings you to Tishri, seventh month, tenth day. What is that significant? That is the Day of Atonement Judgment, but also, what is that? That is the Jubilee. Remember what we saw? Leviticus 25, verse 10. You'll, well, let me go back here. 
It says, you'll cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound when? The tenth day of the seventh month. So Jesus went through the 40 days of temptation through the month of Elul and the 10 days up to the seventh day and the tenth month. And he completed that. It's also, when he had finished this, comes up to the Day of Atonement, that he had passed the test. And he had been shown to have been, of course, conquering the devil and overcoming so this trumpet of the Jubilee, and what's this Jubilee all about? It's all about coming to the place of total liberty and to bring a restoration of all things. That's what Jesus came to bring forth. And as we come to chapter 4, after he was tempted for those 40 days and he finished that, what happened then? That's when he began his ministry. We come down to verse 13, he ended all the temptation, departed from the season, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. Now he had finished the temptation. This would be on the seventh day, seventh month, tenth day, when he finished it, which is on the Day of Atonement. And that would be before the 17th day. And remember, it said he was about 30 years old. So this would be prior to the time when he became 30. He would have become 30 at the time of tabernacles. And why would that be? Because remember, we'll come back here in a second. How can we know that Jesus was born at the time of tabernacles? He certainly wasn't born on December 25th, that's for sure. Because John 1, 14, the Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. The word dwelt is the word for tabernacle. We also pointed out, and we'll talk about at a later time that Jesus was definitely born at Tabernacles because that's the time of the tax. That was the time when the shepherd still had the sheep out in the field. That was the time when there was no room in the inn. So they had to have a stable, you know, where he was being born. And that's because everybody came in for Tabernacles for the feast and there was no room. So he was born at the time of Tabernacles. So in light of that, we see the fact that Jesus began his ministry at this particular time. By the way, when you are under the temptation or attacks of the devil, does that mean once you have conquered that you're going to be all worn out and you have all these attacks and so forth? No, he returned to the power of the Spirit. <laughs> Don't believe the lie that you're going to get all beat up by the devil and just barely make it through. No. He returned in the power of the Spirit because you're going to conquer everything. He's not going to wear you down. You're going to conquer Him. So don't believe that lie that makes you think that you're going to have a big attack after the, you know, if, if God does something, if some enemy comes against you in your life. No, you're going, to get, you're going to conquer Him and you're going to stay with strength and might. And that's what He did. He returned in the power of the Spirit. So what did He start doing? He started teaching in their synagogues. When would that have been? right there after the fourth, after the seventh month, tenth day. And what is he doing? He's bringing the teaching regarding the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee, which is total liberty and restoration, not only for man, but also for the earth. Everything is going to be restored. But it begins with Jesus coming and bringing the teaching about this. How do we know that happened? Read on. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day that week was on the 13th day of the seventh month, Tishri. The 10th day was on a Wednesday. That would have when he would have begun his ministry. This is a few days after that, and we'll show you why that's so. So he goes on the Sabbath day, as his custom was, stood up for read. And he, gave, he was delivered the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he found the place where it was written in the book. So he found a specific place. Why? Because he is bringing the fulfillment of this place that he's going to read from. And what does he say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What's the acceptable year of the Lord? Jubilee. Every 50 years was the acceptable year. So what's he doing? He's preaching about what Jubilee is all about, bringing deliverance, healing, restoration, and the restoration of all things. He's beginning to preach it, because that's what Jesus came in his earthly ministry 
to bring forth the liberty. And he started out by preaching the gospel, bringing healing, casting out the demons out of people, doing uh, recovering sight of blind, setting at liberty. What do we see Jesus doing? He went forth casting out the demons and healing the sick and setting all the people free. What was he doing? He's bringing the liberty. In fact, remember how many times he was always doing it on the Sabbath? Well, what, was, what does that represent? That means all the liberty he's bringing is going to actually be fulfilled finally at the time of what the Sabbath is all about, which is what? The seventh day. After man's six days of work are over, and that means what's happened on the seventh day. That's going to be the final fulfillment of his liberty, which is when he now is going to bring the judgment on the nations as he opens up the title deed to the earth and he conquers all of the works of the enemy to bring forth the total liberty. That's why he did it on the Sabbath continually. They, they were so mad about it, you know. He was, they, didn't, they didn't understand what he was bringing forth. The Sabbath was showing man's not going to, his work is over, it's done. Now it's God who is doing the work to bring forth the restoration of all things. And that's what he did. So the reason why we know this is after he had started his ministry, because, of course, he closed the book, sat down, the eyes of all them were on, fastened on him, began to say, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now when he said this day is the scripture fulfilled, is he talking about that particular day it was fulfilled? No. Why? Because it's a perfect tense. See, everything in the Word is important to know. The perfect tense is important here. Why? Because it speaks of action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking. What it means is, he's saying this day, this scripture has already been fulfilled in the past with the present results of it's, going, it's being fulfilled now as well. When did it start? Three days before when he began to preach the gospel. That's why the perfect tense has to be the rendering of the verb because it's explaining that when that it would happen prior to this particular time when he's speaking. So Jesus began on the seventh month, tenth day, to do his ministry, bringing forth the Jubilee, the, re the revelation of what the Jubilee was about and doing the works of casting out the demons. Of course, did they uh, accept this? No, they got mad about it. They, were, they, they, could, they, could, could, they wondered at this. They couldn't believe it. And, of course, he said, you know, uh, you'll say this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever you've done in Capernaum, do also here in the country. And he said, no prophet's accepted his own country. Where was he from? Nazareth. Were they going to be accepted in, in there? No. <laughs> and he goes on and he comes down to verse 28. All day in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. They were mad about it. <laughs> you thought they would have accepted him. No, they rejected everything that he said. In fact, they rose up, thrust him out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill where the city was built. They're going to throw him down over the hill and kill him. They might cast him down headlong. Of course, he passing through the midst of them, he had dominion. He bound all the devils that were in him. The devils were trying to kill him through all those people. And he walked right through the midst of them and, of course, went on his way preaching the gospel. But the point being is Jesus is the one who brought the curse. He's the one who brings the reverse of the curse. And this was the seventh month, 17th day, when, every, when we see that it declares that the curse would be reversed. It would start. And it's pointing towards when Jesus came. Jesus more than likely was bo born on the seventh month, 17th day, because he was about 30 years old, not quite that, when he began his ministry. And what was his ministry all about? It was bringing the reverse of the curse. That's casting out the demons, healing the sick. That's getting rid of the curse on people, seeing people be set free from all kinds of bondages. It all points towards the great work that Jesus would accomplish. And of course, he did that when he began, as uh, we'll see later, when he was casting out the demons, healing the sick, uh, prior to the time when he went to the cross. But that was of a necessity that he needed to do that first. Not just come and just go to the cross. He had to fulfill all things. He had to fulfill what was necessary to bring the revelation of what Jubilee was all about. And the Jubilee is about 
restoration of all things and man being delivered and everything being restored. And that's exactly what he brought forth. Now, at this point, what happened then from then on? After we see the destruction, now God began to deal with man and have covenants. What did he do? Genesis 9.9, 9, Behold, he says, I establish my covenant with you and your seed after you. Notice the seed is not talking about seeds, which would be your line, child after child. It's your seed. That's singular. So the covenant was not only established with Noah, but also with the seed after him. And this was that, of course, that he wasn't going to kill, wipe out the earth again by waters of a flood. Of course, the next judgment, which it will come, is going to be by fire instead. But nonetheless, and of course, what did he do? He put the rainbow there, the token was, that for all the generations that the bow would be set in the cloud. And of course, we see it all the time. It's all started way back then and it's still here today. His covenant, the fact that he will not destroy the earth by a flood again. Well, we see that then as people then, of course, were not born again. And what happened with all these people? Well, they began to again rebel against God. They didn't walk in his ways. But he had those who would walk in, that were in covenant relationship with him, that you'll see Abraham, he would make a covenant with him, found somebody who would follow him. But prior to that, of course, the devil's at work to try to bring destruction and to lead man away from God. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech at that time. There weren't many languages. There was only one language and one speech at that point. So what did the men, all the people do? Well, they decided that they were going to do something. In verse 4, let, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Let us make a name, we may be, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. The city speaks of government. The tower speaks of religion. What was this? This is man rebelling against God, wanting to make his own government and make his own religion. And this is all speaking of globalism, which is not of God. God's the one who made the nations. And we see, of course, that's exactly what the plan is for these ones today, to bring forth a one world order, to dissolve all nations, and to bring forth a one world government, and to bring forth also a one world religion under the Antichrist who will come on the scene. This is all of course, what they tried to do then, but that's what's going to happen again. And so the Lord came down to see the city and the towers, the children of men build it. And so what's he going to do? He's going to get rid of that. He goes and confounds their languages that they may not understand one another's speech and scatters them abroad. From that point on, we have all these languages and they left off to build the city. So he scattered that. He stopped what their work was. At the same time, though, it says in verse 9, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, which means confusion, by mixing. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them broad upon the face of all the earth. So here we see that the attempt to bring forth a one-world government and a one-world religion failed, of course, but that's what they were trying to do because they did not want to follow God's law, his government, and they did not want to follow his way of walking after the way of the word of God, the true lit religion. So, God now, he's made the covenant, he's not going to destroy, that's the first covenant, he's not going to destroy the earth by a flood any longer. We come to Genesis 12. He finds a man, Abram. He says, get thee out of thy country from a kindred, and thy kindred from thy father's house to a land that I'll show thee. He said, I'll make of thee a great nation. I'll bless thee and make thy name great, and you shall be a blessing. And so he takes him, and he makes this, he says this to him. It wasn't just to Abraham, or Abram at this time. The Lord appeared to Abram in verse 7, said, Unto thy seed will I give the land. So this now, and what's the land we're talking about? We're talking about Eretz, the earth. 
because there wasn't just a land, but it really is pointing towards the earth. This one, who is the seed, is going to get the earth back. And who is that one? It is Christ, as you'll see. So here, this was made. He's going to give them the land, a physical land, but it's all really pointing towards Jesus, who's going to take back the earth. And so this is the covenant that he made with them. We see the covenant gets made in Genesis 15, verse 18. Same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed, singular, have I given this land from the river Euphrates, the great river, and the river, the river Euphrates. So he makes a covenant with him at this point in time. And then we come down to verse 17, and he speaks more about this, what's important to realize. This is before he's going to be ready to have the child, remember. And he comes to Abram and said, I'm the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. In speaking this, he said, I'll make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And we come now down here to verse 7, and he says, I'll establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed, singular, after thee. So this covenant, again, was made not only between Abraham, but also between God and Abraham, but also with the seed, who is Christ. And this covenant was to walk before with him and be perfect. And that's what Jesus had to do to fulfill it. But it also is pointing towards what you and I must do. When we come in the covenant, we're going to walk before him and be perfect before him as well and follow the way of the Lord. And then he points out what this seed is going to do prophetically when he says in verse 10, this is my covenant that you'll keep between me and you and thy seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. You circumcise the flesh. Well, that's what they did in the Old Testament, pointing towards the real circumcision. And what's the real circumcision? It's circumcision in spirit, which we see is what happens when you and I receive Jesus Christ and get born again. All of these things were pointing towards the fulfillment of it in the reality of it in spirit by Jesus. Notice Romans 2.28, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision which is outward in the flesh. That's what it was during the Old Testament. All these things were done in the flesh pointing towards the reality that was going to be done in the spirit for all of mankind who had received Jesus. We see, he's a Jew who is not one inwardly, but circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So who are the ones that are the real Jews, the ones who get born again, get a brand new spirit, get a brand new heart? And what is this all pointing towards? It is pointing toward the, the physical circumcision. It was talking about the spiritual circumcision, where we get a brand new spirit and a brand new heart in the New Testament. And also, the things that he told them to do they were all necessary because in order for this to happen, remember, when you come in a covenant, in order for God to perform what he said, the, a man also had to meet the conditions and perform what his part was. And this is why in Genesis 22, God tested, not tempted, but tested and proved Abraham. and said, Abraham, he said, here, behold, here am I. And what did he tell him to do? Take thy son, thine only son Isaac, who he said was going to be, the seed was going to, he's make a covenant with him, and the seed would bring all these things forth. So he's going to live ongoingly. Whom thou lovest, get thee in the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. You're going to kill him? You're going to offer him for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, I'll tell thee. So what does he do? He obeys. And Abraham understood what was going on, because he makes the statement in verse 5 when he comes up to this mountain, Abide ye here with the ass, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Well, wait a minute, if he offered him as a burnt offering, is he going to be around to come back? <laughs> no, he's going to be burnt offering, remember. But he says, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again. We're coming back. Meaning, he had the revelation that was spoken to him, that would have shown him the fact that he was going to offer, but God would raise him from the dead because the covenant was made between him and the seed, which means he had to stay alive. He had to be alive. And of course, that was, uh, he understood what God said he would bring to pass. 
So he goes up there, remember, and he's, he's ready to um, um, do this. He's got the fire in the wood, and the son says, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham says a prophetic thing, my son, God will provide himself. Aha, uh -huh. God's going to be the sacrifice, a lamb. And who is that? God in Christ, it was Jesus, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world for the burnt offering. Prophetic statement. So they come to the place, he bounds him up here, he's ready to, to kill him. He stretched forth his hand, takes the knife to slay the son. And of course, he's ready to do this. And the angel calls and says, Abraham, here I am. Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Because he knew that he'd raise him from the dead if he killed him. But notice this. One thing you have to understand. Does God know everything you're going to do? No. For now I know that thou fearest God. How did he know? Because he was going to go through with it. Because of his actions. God knows you by what you end up doing. Not the fact that you... I mean, you know, in this case, if he would have gone through, he wouldn't have known. But now it says, now I know that you fear God. He proved it to him. You and I proved to God that we fear God by doing what he says as well. Seeing you've not withheld your only son. So, of course, he lifted up his eyes, saw the ram caught in the thicket, offered him as a burnt offering instead, pointing towards that there was going to be a different burnt offering. Who was that going to be? It's going to be Jesus Jesus was going to be the one who was going to be. But because he was willing to do that, he then uh, was, of course, had found that he had done what was right. Verse 16, my, my, myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, because you've done this thing, you have not withheld your son, your only son. In blessing I will bless thee. Multiply and I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand upon the seashore. And thy seed, who's the seed pointing towards? Jesus shall possess the gate of his enemies, which means Jesus was going to conquer the enemies and he was going to overcome them all, which of course he would do. That was prophetic of that. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Who's going to bring the blessing on all the nations? Jesus, the seed. This is all prophetic of these things. And also because of the fact that he was willing to offer up his son, it was accounted as having offered up him and seeing him raised from the dead. Because Hebrews 11:17 17 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. It's as if he did it because he was willing to do it. Of whom it said that Isaac shall thy seed be called. Counting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Because he was willing to do that, it was accounted as him raising from the dead, and which what to do? He had said in, in doing so, from whence he received him, the raising of the dead of Jesus in a figure, the seed. Tremendous what he had to do. So this was the second covenant. Then we come to the third covenant. The third covenant was the covenant with Moses. In Exodus, because God, these, all these are talking about what has to happen to bring forth the restoration, the total rest restoration of all things, which is what the reversing the curse, which is what the Jubilee is all about ultimately. We come down to Exodus 34, verse 10. He's speaking to Moses here, and he says, Behold, I'll make a covenant before all thy people. I'll do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. All the people among thou art shall see the work of the Lord, the terrible thing that I will do with thee. Here he's going to do this great work. And what is he doing? He's going to do all these miraculous works, and he's going to form all these covenant promises that he's going to bring to pass. Prior to this, we go back to Exodus chapter 3. And you must understand, God progressively revealed himself and the things he would do through the Old Testament. Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses when he was talking about what name he was called, I am that I am. 
You'll say in the children of Israel, because they were saying, who sent you? I am has sent me. And this really means I am being that I am being. The one who's present ongoingly, who would accomplish his great work. So the name, what was this? This is the covenant keeping name. I am that I am. And that, that was the name of Jehovah, which would be Jehovah Rapha, the one who heals us. Jehovah Ra, the one who's the shepherd who leads us. Jehovah Jireh, the one who sees ahead to meet all of our needs. All these different, Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. This is the covenant keeping name of the Lord. Jehovah is what it's talking about here. That was the name that he was revealing to him. That I am that I am, and that was all through this name of Jehovah, the covenant keeping name that we see constantly throughout uh, the, the Old T the Testament. But then there's also, that's the one thing he revealed, but he also later made a statement here in Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. Very interesting. He says, I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name of God Almighty. That wasn't Jehovah. That is the name El Shaddai. El Shaddai means the powerful, mighty God. He revealed himself first as El Shaddai. But by my name Jehovah, this is the name of the covenant-keeping name, was I not known to them. This reveals the fact that the names of God reveal who he is and what he does. That's important to understand. Many people thought there's just some special one name. There isn't. The names of God reveal what were they brought forth. They reveal who he is and what he does. Just like the name Jesus reveals what he was to come to do. He came to save, bring salvation to mankind. People that think that they're, they all get off on a name is a mistake. They're failing to understand. The names of the Lord are a revelation of who he is and what he does. Not some special name that people have been so deceived about. So he's revealing himself by these names. And in making this covenant, he also, in the covenant, he's speaking promises that are going to come to pass. And this is a prophetic promise that would come to pass, not during the Old Testament period, but later on. Because in the Old Testament, when they set up the covenant, there was only one tribe that could be the priesthood. It was the tribe of Levi. But in Exodus 19.5, he's saying to all the people, Now therefore, if you'll obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is all of them. This couldn't be fulfilled in the Old Testament period because only one tribe was a tribe that was a priesthood. It was the tribe of Levi. But now he's speaking to them all. They're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. When could that be fulfilled? Not until the New Testament era. And we know that that's exactly what gets fulfilled in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, when it says, You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. So this is when they became a kingdom of priests. So he's making promises, but he's also speaking prophetic things at the same time. And this points to the fulfillment of it. And oh, what was this covenant with? It was with a seed, with Jesus. All the covenants were always pointing towards Jesus, who would be the fulfillment of it. And there's a fourth covenant that we have to mention before we stop here that's important to realize. This is the covenant that he made with David. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. When thy days be fulfilled, speaking to David, you'll sleep with their fathers, and I will set up thy seed after thee. Now Solomon was the seed initially, but the seed he's talking about is the one who would come from the messianic lineage down the road, who was Jesus, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, what's the what is it pointing towards? It's talking about the kingdom of Jesus Christ. His kingdom would come into manifestation. And he shall build a house for my name. 
Solomon did build a house, which was a physical house, the sec that temple afterwards, remember. But what's this all pointing towards? It's talking about the spiritual house. Who's the one who builds the spiritual house? Jesus does. And establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Jesus is the fulfillment of this. We know this when we go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we see, we saw verse 5 was that you as lively stones or living stones, which is what we become when we get born again, are built up a spiritual house, are being built up a spiritual house, this means. It shows the ongoing work of him because the word our build up is a present tense, ongoing action, passive voice being done by God, our being built up is the way you would translate it, a spiritual house. So there was a physical house made, it's the temple, but what's all these po pointing towards? Everything of the covenant, everything that was done, always pointed towards the spiritual reality being fulfilled by Jesus Christ. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And this spiritual house, who is going to be the one that's going to be starting it and bringing this building, this house? Jesus. And how do you start a house? You lay the cornerstone and then you start building. Verse 6, also is contained in, the, contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Ah, that's the beginning of the house. Elect, precious. It's a person, not a stone, but it's the cornerstone of the spiritual house of God, which you and I are living stones a part of. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded, of course. He is the one. But that's the stone that the builders disallowed. They rejected him, even though he was the head of the corner. He was the corner stone, as it speaks. So this is the other aspect of the, the, the covenant that was made. So we see that these covenants were made. First of all, he made a covenant with Noah. He wasn't going to destroy the earth anymore by water. But he was going to come and destroy all these nations that are going to see a judgment by fire. And ultimately, the earth will be destroyed by what? By fire, it's all gonna be burned up. The heavens and the earth are gonna be burned up because there's gonna be a new heavens and a new earth. And this is what this is all pointing towards with that first covenant that's made with a seed. And the second covenant there with Abraham, that was all the circumcision that was going to happen, meaning there's gonna now be a spiritual circumcision we're going to get a brand new spirit. We're going to get born again and get a new heart. And we're now going to walk before him and be perfect. Jesus did it, but also it's pointing towards you and me of the actual fulfillment. Not only that Jesus had to do it, but it's going to be fulfilled in you and me because you and I are going to walk before him and be perfect and go on into perfection. And then the third covenant was the covenant-keeping name of the Lord, where he'd perform all these promises, a revelation of who he is and what he's done. You and I have all these promises. And now, what's the covenant-keeping name in the New Testament? It's the name of Jesus, the name above every name. That's why we do everything in the name of Jesus. It's a, the means of releasing the authority to conquer the enemy. We cast out the demons in the name of Jesus. We heal the sick in the name of Jesus. When we pray to see the promises, we do everything in the name of Jesus because it, it is, is the covenant keeping name. Jehovah, the I am that I am, is fulfilled in Jesus now who is the covenant keeping name that brings forth all the promises of the New Testament. Now, we also see that we have this fourth covenant which is of the kingdom of God and of this building of the house. And who's the fulfiller of it? Jesus. Jesus brought forth this kingdom into being. Remember, he came operating as a king from heaven. But as you will see later as we go, he had to die. So he wasn't the king anymore when he died. Because he was made sin. But what happened? He accomplished the redemption. He accomplished the reconciliation. He was born from spiritual death to spiritual life for us. And he became now, again, a father. He was a son to the father. And what happened? Because he made a covenant with God before he died, the new covenant. But how does a covenant come into manifestation? You've got to have the death of the testator who made it. 
a testament or a covenant doesn't come into manifestation until the person who made it died. And so after he was born, the first born from the dead, now he is the heir, he's the son, he's the firstborn, and he's the one who could then bring this covenant into manifestation. And what was this covenant of? Of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Jesus then, he came showing him forth what he was going to produce. Remember, he came as, as a king having salvation, pointing towards what he was going to accomplish after he had done the redemption and the reconciliation. He brought forth the kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and he brought forth then the pr promises of the accomplishment of the building of the spiritual house, the kingdom and the house. And how did that start? It started with Jesus. He's the one who's the builder of the house, the cornerstone. And how you and I get involved in it? We become living stones and we're born again. And we are continually being built up a spiritual house for God. And what's the spiritual house? For you, for him, not only for you to be, see all the things done in your life, but a place where what's God going to do? He's going to come and dwell in that house. And you and I are coming to the place of righteous, holy, and perfection so God can come and dwell in us because what's going to happen? When He comes and dwells in us, what is that going to manifest? The glory of God. He, His presence, brings the glory of God. What's going to happen to the end time church, as we've been talking about, that are righteous, that are holy, that go on to perfection? The glory of God is coming into it. And if you remember, and we talked about in Ezekiel, in chapter 40, that temple that it speaks of is a temple that's never existed before. It's not a physical one. It's a spiritual temple. And if you remember, we talked about that that was at the time of the Jubilee when all that was occurring. And that's when the presence of God comes into this temple. It's all pointing towards the fulfillment of the work of God and how he's going to come and manifest himself in the end time church as well. That's what it's all about. This is the tremendous promises that were shown forth in all the types pointing towards the fulfillment by Jesus Christ. The fact that he's going to bring the destruction of the earth by fire to bring a new one. Not by water, it's going to be by fire. He's going to bring forth a new birth. We're going to walk before him and be perfect and see this total work be accomplished. He's going to perform all of his covenant promises, the covenant name of the Lord, where he's revealing who he is, and he's going to come to the place where we're all going to be kings and priests, a holy nation, and we're also going to come into the kingdom, and we're going to be operating as kings, the priesthood of the kings, the ruling and reigning, and also seeing the spiritual house of God be built so we become to the place where now the glory of God can come and dwell in us because we're going to be the righteous, holy, perfected ones because we obey and let him have his way to accomplish his total work in us. That's what all these covenants are pointing towards. And who's the one who fulfills it? Jesus. And what's he doing? He's reversing the total curse that's affected all of mankind. And what's he going to do? He's going to bring the jubilee manifestation at the end of the 120, 50 years, the 6,000 years jubilee. He's going to bring this manifestation of the jubilee deliverance from Satan and from the evil ones of this world. He is going to bring forth the manifestation of the glorious, mighty church that's going to be here. And then, of course, that's who's going to be caught up to meet him in the air, remember and go to heaven of the ones who are without spot, without wrinkle, their glorious church that will be with Jesus and then coming back with him to rule and to reign for a thousand years. It's tremendous what it's all about. What Jesus has done is the fulfillment of all the things that were spoken in the covenants that were brought forth in the Old Testament and he's the one who fulfills it all. And he not only fulfilled it for us, he, he fulfilled it, and he's fulfilling it in your life. So you come to the place of being the place where God's coming to dwell in you. The spiritual house is built. You come to perfection. The glory of God's manifest. And you're going to be ready as you're doing these things. You're going to be ready for ruling and reigning in the, end, the, the, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ as you see the work of God accomplished. It's tremendous what he has done for us. When you understand what the covenants
purpose were and why they were all for the seed, because he's the fulfiller of it. And he's the one who brings forth the spiritual reality of it. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation of the Word of God that brings forth the work of Jesus Christ to accomplish the total restoration. I understand all the things that happen in the physical were pointing towards the spiritual realities that would be fulfilled, that will be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. I thank you for what he has done and what he's continuing to do. He's working in me, building the spiritual house so that I come to the place of walking before him and being perfect and seeing all the covenant promises come to pass in my life. See the total work accomplished, raising me up that I will be as a king, ruling and reigning. The spiritual house will be completed. I will go on to perfection and the glory of God is coming into me. I will be a part of the glorious church. I see the fulfillment of all the covenant was about. Jesus performs it. And as I do what he says, it'll be performed in our lives. And we will be that holy, perfected, glorious church. Thank you for accomplishing this great work. And we understand this is the Jubilee work of Jesus Christ who comes to set us free, restore all things. And he ultimately then will bring forth the elimination of this heaven, this heavens and earth, there'll be a new one, brand new, where only righteousness dwells. And because I see this work, having met the conditions accomplished in me, I will be with the Father and with Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth for eternity. Seeing this, I'm putting the word of God first place in everything I do because this must be accomplished in my life. I will make sure that I'm a doer of the word so all these covenant promises get fulfilled in my life. Thank you for doing it because I'm a hearer and a doer of your word in Jesus name. Amen. Father, I thank you for helping everybody to understand and see but all these Old Testament things we're pointing towards and everything to the seed is all about what Jesus accomplishes and also what he does in us. Thank you. We see the truth. We know it's going to all be performed. Thank you for accomplishing it in our life as well. We praise you for this tremendous work that you have accomplished thus far and what you will continue to accomplish Thank you for the revelation of the truth. We'll be hearers and doers of the word. See it accomplished in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.